All right. So remember that Lee has launched a northern invasion toward Pennsylvania. Do y'all remember what vital Pennsylvanian city Lee is aiming to attack and control? It's a good guess, but that's not what I'm looking for. Capital of Pennsylvania? Starts with an H. Harrisburg, very good. Harrisburg, um, for a couple of reasons, vital rail lines coming in and out of Harrisburg from all directions, and then obviously uh, the Susquehanna flowing through the capital. Um, this is a ploy to take the pressure off the Confederacy in the West, also a ploy to appeal to the Peace Democrats, the Copperheads, and of course take the pressure off Richmond. We already talked about how this whole campaign begins in Northern Virginia and the staging area of this campaign occurs at Brandy Station and that is the first time that the Confederate cavalry, Jeb Stewart's cavalry, had been checked by Alfred Pleasanton's Union cavalry. And this leads Stuart to go on a ride around the rear of the Union Army, but it keeps Stuart away from the Lee's army for over a week, which ultimately leads to Lee sort of being blind going into what will be the largest battle of the war. It's a three-day battle. Neither side intended to fight in the town of Gettysburg. Obviously, the, the terrain worked out, and we'll discuss that by the end of the, by the, end of the class. But um, what they're looking for is supply. Gettysburg had roads from all directions entering this town. It was a college town. A little seminary uh, was in this town. There was plenty of foodstuffs. There was um, uh, much-needed shoes. So both Confederate and Union forces are looking for supply. A.P. Hill's division on July 1st comes into the town to get shoes, but John Buford's cavalry division, uh, Union cavalry division, encounters A.P. Hill's um, uh, corps or a couple of divisions from his corps, and some initial shots are fired. There's a really famous moment in this where the the Buford's cavalry scouts see uh, Hill's men, shots are fired at them, and then one of Hill's men's men takes off his plumed cap, gives a great bow, puts his hat back on, and then this battle ensues on July 1st. Um, similar to what we would have seen on the first day at Chancellorsville. Um, the, on day one, the Union is pushed back. They rush through the town of Gettysburg, and the, the Confederates essentially sort of win the first day. But if, keep in mind that Lee didn't have any plans on fighting in this town, nor did George Meade. George Meade had planned to use the Pike Creek line um, between Pennsylvania, Baltimore, and Washington. So what ultimately happens here, you get about 25,000 Confederates in action, um, and it leads to Oliver O'Howard being in the exact same scenario he was at Chancellorsville, um, where he was overrun by Jackson's men. Now he's being pushed back and beaten back um, by Hill's men. By early afternoon, the Federal line sort of formed a semicircle um, north or west, north, and northeast of Gettysburg. Yule's Corps, the second corps, are going to concentrate. Remember, Hill has the third corps. The second and third corps, commanded by Yule and Hill, that's previously Stonewall Jackson's uh, second corps. They are going to focus on the high ground at 
Culp's Hill. So Culp's Hill is on the far northern side of Cemetery Ridge and northwest of Cemetery Hill. But keep also keep in mind, we've talked about this before, Lee and Longstreet do not get their intelligence from Stewart on union movements. They get their intelligence from a paid spy. And that's something that Lee was not happy about. He wants Yule to take Cemetery Ridge. This is one of the most hotly debated issues of the Battle of Gettysburg, even more so possibly than Stewart showing up late. Had Yule taken Culp's Hill and taken Cemetery Hill and the Confederates controlled Cemetery Ridge, the outcome of this battle may have been very different. Honestly, the outcome of this battle, as we know it, may never have occurred because Meade may have been cautious and withdrew, withdrawn from uh, trying to, to fight against that, that high of a, a defensive position. Another factor here is that had Jackson been alive, would Jackson have taken Culp's Hill and Cemetery Ridge? Well, we all, we all know that chances are Jackson would have taken that ground. So these are questions, these are hypotheticals that um, historians still debate in relation to Gettysburg. So this is what I'm referring to. I'm referring to Culp's Hill. Cemetery Hill, Cemetery Ridge, Little Round Top, and Round Top, all right? So Reynolds and Howard's divisions, or sorry, Reynolds First Corps and Howard's 11th Corps are gonna be pushed back through the town. One of the most devastating parts of the first day was John Reynolds is killed. He is one of the most um, well-respected and considered by many to be the, uh, the best general in the Union Army. He is a Pennsylvania native. Um, he's shot by a Confederate sniper. John Reynolds' death is a timely death, but it's also um, another part of the Battle of Gettysburg that needs to be addressed. This is the first time that the Union had fought on their, uh, many of these guys had fought on their home soil. And I guess we could make an argument for Antietam fighting in Maryland, but fighting in Pennsylvania was north of the Mason and Dixon line. So it was a whole different ballgame, right? They were fighting now to defend their homeland. And by losing Reynolds, that it, it devastated a lot of the men, but it did, in, it, it, it boosted morale. Guys were, wanted to avenge Reynolds, a Pennsylvania native, and they wanted to fight for uh, Union soil. Reynolds' uh, corps will be taken over um, by Abner Doubleday, I, I mentioned before. Um, he's the guy that is, it's kind of a sketchy uh, historical um, uh, tale. A lot of people want to give Doubleday credit for being the founder of, of and the father of baseball. We do know that Doubleday's guys, uh, notably the, the um, volunteer firefighters, they did play baseball. All kinds of guys on both sides played baseball throughout the war. That's how baseball became popularized and became the American pastime. Doubleday just kind of goes down in history because Doubleday and his guys are from Cooperstown and then they moved the Baseball Hall of Fame to Cooperstown and that's how it, you know, it kind of goes hand in hand. Question? Or, yeah. yeah. Um, when, when General dies at the end of the battle, what happens to the club? What do they follow? They just have a, they have like a, um, so actually Reynolds was with Buford when he was killed and they they were, they had to decide very quickly like who's going to take command and so the next in command was Doubleday. Doubleday was another one of those guys who was very popular among the men. Um, Buford, similar deal, but Buford was a cavalry commander so it didn't make any sense for Buford to take control of an entire corps. Buford was like one of these, uh, in terms of cavalry experience, Buford's experience went all the way back to the Western Indian Wars and the Mexican War, and he and some of his like cavalry tactics, like 
um, like dismounting tactics were like developed by Buford. So he would like kind of rival like Jeb Stewart or um, Nathan Bedford Forrest or any of these guys. But uh, Double Day um, was Double Day the right guy for the command? I, I don't know. He wasn't on that. He wasn't on John Reynolds level. Yeah. I mean, Reynolds was like highly decorated West Point graduate. Probably was was in the was on the short list for uh, receiving command when they removed Hooker. In yeah. fact, Lee was shocked that Reynolds didn't get the command and that Meade had the command. So if things would have been a little bit a little bit different, say Reynolds gained that command, chances are Meade would have ended up as commander of the first corps. Yeah. Or or double day. Right. I mean, again, Meade Meade had all that kind of like the Mexican War, yeah, West Pointer, you know, politically connected, you know, all that. So chances are we are probably going to meet every double day anyway. Um, but double day, I mean, double day digs into a defensive position. He and his men, really, the the true core commander that really like holds strong throughout the the three days at Gettysburg, or technically two, three, is Winfield Scott Hancock. He holds the center, um, and we'll talk about how Meade actually did a great job of communicating and getting troops into position, and Doubleday rose to the occasion as well. So, I don't know, that's kind of like a hard, that's sort of like a tough um, hypothetical to look at, like, Who's any more capable? Well, by this time, so many of these guys had commanded large-scale battles, and they're lucky to be alive anyway. You know, even even officers. I mean, think about Joe Hooker. I mean, he was almost killed at Chancellorsville. So now Hooker is obviously he's he's out. He's been demoted, but he's still in the army. Um, so that's my next thing. Back to so Winfield Scott Hancock's score. Um, the Second Corps arrives on the field. They're going to hold everything from Culp's Hill all the way to the center position of Cemetery Ridge. And that's where Winfield Scott Hancock is going to, to really hold the line. But this is kind of nuts. Th these are some serious casualties on day one. Um, missing, killed, wounded, 9,000 on the Union side, 6,500. This is another one of those weird scenarios where if we look at a casualty report, it looks like the Confederates run the first day, but if we look at tactical um, position, they did not, right? And th this is where we come to the 2nd of July, and the true turning point, there's John Reynolds and Abner Doubleday. Um, if we take a look at the map, we see Hill's, Hill's arm, uh, Corps slams into Reynolds' Corps. Reynolds is killed there um, just outside just northeast outside of Gettysburg. Yule's men are going to hit Howard's 11th Corps, and then they retreat through Gettysburg to hold the high ground at Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill. This is where, and I, and I know that you're probably wondering, like, we could say, oh, the turning point of Gettysburg is the literal fact that Lee turned around and had to retreat. But really, the turning point of Gettysburg is in this moment on July 2nd, because Longstreet has no interest in fighting this battle. Lee is coming off of major victories at Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville and feels that if they hit the Union Army before they get reinforced, then they'll be able to control the high ground. It might take a lot of casualties, but you know this, this is the, the place to strike. What Longstreet wants to do is Longstreet wants to actually fall back and move between the Union Army, between Gettysburg and and um, Washington, D.C., and figure out 
somewhere between the South Mountain Pass and into Eastern Maryland and the District of Columbia, figure out where that fighting will occur. So they are fighting on their terms, not trying to take a defensive position. You have to look at the contours of the position of, of each army, okay? The contour of everything from Little Round Top all the way to Culp's Hill, the Union could easily move reinforcements, easily set up cannon on the high ground and artillery, and easily communicate. The same did not, the same was not the scenario at the Confederate position, which is known as Seminary Ridge. So the Union had more than just a high ground advantage. They had a, they had advantages for communication, they had advantages advantage for positioning, they had advantage for movement. They also had an advantage of supply. All right? What they don't understand is that the Confederate line is thin and the Confederate supply, notably the artillery supply, is low. What's up, buddy? Um, what were the defenses around Washington? Like, did it impossible to just go around the Union and just you know, march down and down? That is what, that is another um, hypothetical moment in history where when you look at the importance of Stonewall Jackson and his death in 1863. Longstreet and Jackson, Jackson wanted nothing more than to press upon Washington and attack Washington. If Longstreet and Jackson together could convince Lee in a war council situation to break behind, and it, it, it's, hard, it's hard to say, like, what would Jackson have done? I mean, we know that Jack, you know, we, we have seen what Jackson's done in battle, right? It could have gone either way. We also know that Longstreet is a tactical defensive fighter. So does Jackson, that again, this takes a, the hypothetical a step further. Would they have even been up in this position on the 2nd of July if Jackson would have lived? Because Jackson may very well have occupied Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill by, this, by the 2nd. So there's some interesting parts of that. To answer the main part of this question, the defensive line of DC was thin because the entire concentration of the Army of the Potomac is moving toward Gettysburg with intelligence that this battle is going down in the small college town in central PA. Does that help, help you out? Um, all right. So, uh, what is Lee's plan? Uh, he wants to hit the Union left, and he wants to hit the Union right. So here's the plan. Longstreet will hit the left at Little Round Top. Yule will hit the right at Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill. And then Hill's forces will focus on the center at Cemetery Ridge. And this is one of those things that I, I, I say this stuff to you all the time. Go places, go visit places, go travel. Visit Gettysburg, please. Take an opportunity at some point in your life to visit Gettysburg. It is a, um, it's a, it's a trip every American should make, I think. Um, well worth your time. So we have uh, obviously Meade and Hancock and Doubleday control Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill and the length of Cemetery Ridge all the way to a little round top. So here is the Union position. From Culp's Hill, wrapped all the way around the length of Cemetery Ridge. This is the Confederate position. This is Seminary Ridge. And here is the town of Gettysburg. So the Union reinforcements are moved up and down the line. One guy does not get the memo, and that is Daniel Sickles. He thinks that he has a, um, he, he does not believe that, uh, that he needs to hold the line, and he ultimately exposes his entire division on the 2nd of July, which ultimately prompts, and this is another kind of bizarre twist of fate, 
it prompts Longstreet and Hill to focus in on Sickles' division that was sticking out like a sore thumb. And that would be Sickles' third corps. So Longstreet spends a lot of the day getting prepared, doesn't launch an attack until 4 p.m. After the war, a lot of Virginians blame Longstreet for the loss of Gettysburg. I think that's a little, I, I don't know. I, I mean, yeah, Longstreet doesn't believe in this attack, and he, he is slow to move in position, but do keep in mind, Longstreet's men, his first corps had marched 25 miles to get to the battlefield. So you can imagine they, were, they had a little fatigue. So Longstreet's divisions led by uh, Hood and McClaws, they start their attack at 4 p.m. Intense fighting in three locations, three locations, Devil's Den, the Wheat Field, and uh, the Peach Orchard. Not to mention the attack on a fourth location, and that's the attack which was a very bizarre uh, circumstance on the second, and that's the attack on Little Round Top. So, Yule hits the right, Hill hits the center, and Longstreet focuses on the Union left. Fighting in the Peach Orchard, fighting in Devil's Den, fighting in the Wheat Field, and then this is going to be an attack launched by the 1st Alabama on Little Round Top. How many people have been to Gettysburg in here? Okay. So if you have not been to Gettysburg, what I would, I would like for you to do when you do go visit at some point in your life, I want you to walk to the top of Little Round Top. And then I want you to think about having an 18 one, 1861 Springfield in hand trying to charge up Little Round Top. This is a very, uh, a very difficult, it's, oh, the terrain is, in some parts, it's straight up. Did you guys hike up Little Round Top by chance? You, you can actually like walk around it up some stairs now, but you know, they'd probably prefer you to do that. Yeah. Oh, wow. Interesting. Is there any way we could get some footage of that? That would be awesome. That is really cool. Yeah, see if it's on the tube of you. Um, all right. So here are, on the left, soldiers. This is a soldier at Devil's Den. This is what Devil's Den looks like on the right. These were pictures taken by Brady's photographers. Top left, the peach orchard. Bottom right is the peach orchard today. And then top left, the wheat field, and then the wheat field there on the right. And then this, can you see how steep Little Round Top is? Um, especially as you get closer to the top. All right, so Little Round Top, the first Alabama squares off of the 20th Maine. The 20th Maine, led by Colonel Joshua Chamberlain, they ran out of ammunition. Do keep in mind the first Alabama, um, that's part of uh, Longstreet's guys who had marched 25 miles to get to the battle. Not They were, they were tired, they were hungry, um, and they, they fought to take Little Round Top. Because if they take Little Round Top and they take the left, then they can roll up the Union um, flank and ultimately have a pincier movement between the assault by Longstreet, or sorry, by Yule and by Hill. So they charge the charge up the um, steep uh, mountainside, and Joshua Chamberlain, thinking on his feet, no ammunition left, has the 20th Maine fixed bayonets, and they perform what is called a left wing wheeling movement movement where they basically act like an entire, uh, it's like kind of like a door. So imagine we have a group of men 
like let's say all of us in this room lined up with fixed bayonets and I said, all right, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna charge downhill, shoulder to shoulder. We're not gonna break ranks no matter what. And we're gonna run, scream, and fight hand to hand moving downhill. They perform this movement and it actually works. In fact, there's a couple of things going on. Number one, they've got momentum on their side. Number two, the first Alabama is in shock that they're actually even performing this maneuver. And number three, uh, the, the Alabama, the men from Alabama are so tired and fatigued, a lot of them just break ranks on this particular uh, bayonet charge and either surrender or run back and break into retreat behind enemy lines. Chamberlain and his men, the 20th Maine, they hold Little Round Top. There's another important division to talk about here as well, and that's the 1st Minnesota. They're a veteran division that has been fighting since Bull Run. They're down to just under 300 men. They are going to be sent in as reinforcements to launch a counterattack. They only return with less than 50 men. They are as important on this day as the 20th Maine for holding the Union left, um, the Union left at uh, at Little Round Top. Casualties were insanely high, 9,000 on each side. So by the end of the second day of Gettysburg, it has become the costliest battle of the war. We're not even factoring in day three quite yet. Um, as for Richard Ewell's second corps, they launched a massive artillery and infantry demonstration on Culp's Hill, but by now, the Union is dug in, they don't gain any ground, and um, Ewell's checked, uh, and the Union maintains control of Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill, Cemetery Ridge, and Little Round Top. So no new position for the Confederates, they don't gain any ground. Here we have Joshua Chamberlain on the left, that was a professor at Bowdoin College, and rather than taking a um, position to uh, teach abroad in a sabbatical, he decides to enlist, enlist wow. in the United States Army. Um, obviously, he's college educated, so he they sent they put him through officer candidate school, and he becomes one of the most decorated, um, sort of like one of the most decorated success stories of the war. Kind of came from nothing, very humble beginnings, uh, to go on to become uh, really well-respected commander um, in the Union Army. He'll get involved in politics. He is also wounded five times in the war, shot through the pelvis, um, and uh, there we have a great deal of um, advancements in the study of urology because of Joshua Chamberlain and surgery performed um, on him uh, during the war. It's a miracle. And do keep in mind the 20th Maine, they had fought in Fredericksburg, they had fought Chancellorsville, they fought in Gettysburg. I mean, they these guys saw some action. Chamberlain was also present. We'll talk about him at the end of the war. He's present at, um, at uh, Appomattox and does, does something a little controversial at Appomattox. We'll talk a little bit about later. All right, so by the end of the day, on July 2nd, um, really everybody's exactly where they were. Um, tragically, Sickles' third corps was absolutely um, nearly destroyed as a result of the his movements without command. So, similar scenario on the third, Longstreet wants to pull back. Um, Lee sees this as retreat. He's not willing to retreat. Why is Lee so adamant? Well, he believes that his army is capable. There's another thing about Lee that you guys need to understand throughout the Battle of, of Gettysburg. Lee's got an issue going on that may have had a problem, it may have 
impacted his judgment. Lee has diarrhea for three straight days at Gettysburg. All right, I'm serious. This is he had he had either contracted a horrible case of diarrhea through eating um, ripened uh, or sorry cherries that weren't ripened, or had picked up some bacteria from drinking water, or yeah, all of the above. Another problem too is when a lot of the guys at Gettysburg had diarrhea because they had eaten corn that was not ripe yet. A lot of the guys, so they're eating green corn. They, you know, they're coming up. They're coming up in the summer, and they're just picking cherries off the trees. And they're, um, you know, I know that sounds really gross, but that is something that I want to put pull in as a factor, right? And historians actually point back to that. You got to think about the illnesses that these guys suffered, the illnesses commanders were suffering. So Lee insists upon an artillery barrage and a full frontal attack to the center. Interestingly enough, Meade uh, kind of pulls a Lee on, a Lee on Lee, meaning that Meade anticipates the entire thing. He digs his men in the center. He basically tells Winfield Scott Hancock, this assault's coming for you. It's going to start with an artillery barrage, and it's going to in with an infantry um, assault, and you've got to be prepared. What happens is very tragic and interesting, and that is this. On the morning of the 3rd, not a whole lot of activity. Everybody's kind of getting in, into position. Just before noon, the Confederates opened a artillery assault that was the largest that they had, they had had for the entire war. They fired for hours. So much firing ensues by the Confederates that it was heard as far as Pittsburgh. All right? And then the firing stops. The Confederates have nearly run out of ammunition. What they don't understand, though, is that their cannon trajectory was too high. They were firing over the infantry dug in behind stone walls the entire time. So as the second phase, some men were, were, were hit, but most of these guys, the cannon just flew over their heads. So the next phase, George Pickett's division of mostly Virginians are going to launch a full frontal infantry assault, a mile long march. Imagine us going down the to that little shopping center down where the road, like, you know, where you, yeah. And our artillery, or we march into artillery and infantry from there to here. It's kind of hard to imagine, right? So it begins this march that's led by Pickett's division of Virginians. And the Union artillery from Little Round Top just opens up on the Confederates. The Confederates, Pickett's division, makes it all the way up to the front, the, the center line, and the just the hardest, most tragic fighting of the war, seen and witnessed by many, occurs where it's just brutal fighting and. By the end of the day, nearly half of the Confederate um, Confederates that fought that day are dead. And that's why some historians call Pickett's Charge sort of a metaphor for, or symbolic of the Confederate cause because it began with such pomp and sort of honor and, and, and sort of like a bold, bold strategy. And as the, as the march continued, men just kept going and going, but it just ended disastrously. Um, so Pickett's charge on the center And 
what will ultimately happen, I just mentioned this, the cannon opened fire in the early afternoon. By 3 p.m., the cannon stopped firing. 12,500 Confederates advanced three quarters of a mile toward Cemetery Ridge. This is known as Pickett's Charge. This is over a mile long front. And here's the charge on the Union Center. Longstreet reluctantly gave this order. Um, some Union and Confederate soldiers that lived through this battle said that it was the absolutely, absolutely the worst thing that they had seen in the entire war. Here we have George Pickett on the left, Winfield Scott Hancock. After the, after the failed charge, Pickett returns back to Lee, and Lee says, General Pickett, where's your division? And he says, I have no division. Pickett blames Lee for the destruction of his army, or his division, rather. Winfield Scott Hancock holds the center line. He's considered one of the heroes of the war. Another anecdote, though, one of Pickett's generals, Lewis Armstead, um, he was on the field that day, and he was Winfield Scott Hancock's best friend. So this is another story of, like, the Brothers' War um, coming to fruition. So by the end of this battle, um, the charge last, lasted less than an hour. Casualties exceeded 50%. Pickett and Longstreet's Corps. Crippling defeat for the Confederates. And we have Pickett's Charge. Um, there's another, we've talked about photographers and artists um, in, the, uh, in class this year. I wanted to point out a guy named, by the name of Alfred R. Wald. Um, he was the sketch artist for Harper's Weekly. So he's kind of like the battle sketch artist. He's like, you know, we've talked about Thomas Nast, the political cartoonist. He's sort of like the Nast of like battlefield sketches. And a lot of the sketches that we've seen from Harper's Weekly this year, and we'll see through the remainder of the war, were uh, sketched by Wad. And I've actually got, for anybody that really or once they look, I've got um, a collection of all the Harper's Weekly um, uh, battle sketches, political cartoons, and a bunch of articles. So, well worth your time if you're interested. So we take a look at the casualty report. Um, missing, killed, wounded. By the end of the three days, over 50,000. Lee reformed his army in preparation for a counterattack, but Meade stayed where he was. So on July 5th, Confederates began their retreat back to Virginia. And now this, again, this is why we would say, well, the Battle of Gettysburg is a turning point in the war because Lee's army was checked. No more northern invasion, and they'll return back to Virginia. But I wanted to point out, where does this really become a turning point? It's not Pickett's charge, guys. It's July 2nd. It's the decision to, to, to try to fight against this insanely uh, de well-defended defensive position. Yeah. Sure. What's up, buddy? Well, um, this kind of makes me, uh, I, I know I might be comparing after the war this year, but um, uh, the, during D-Day, you know, it was like a similar situation with Pickett's charge where you have been True. So, like, how is it that that works? Um, well, you also have, the, on D-Day, you have, uh, this is actually a good point, too. What I did not mention here is that during Pickett's charge, Stuart has arrived at Gettysburg, and he's planning a, an attack to the rear, but he's actually tangled up with Union soldiers. One thing that the Allies had on D-Day, they had a lot of, different things they had. 
you know, a double agent working on their behalf. They had a decoy at close to Dover. Uh, they got really lucky. It was Erwin Rommel's wife's birthday, okay, um, on June 6th. Uh, weather was on their side, okay? But they also had something that no one else in warfare had had before other than the Nazis, and that was paratroopers. So they drop in British and American and Canadian paratroopers in behind enemy lines, and that breaks up that artillery. That's essentially the type of thing that, that Stuart was supposed to do, was to break through the rear, and it just didn't work out. It's a really good point. That's a good, good analogy, especially since you know, that's what we're going to be getting into that specimen. So, um, all right, cool. Uh, so the remainder of 63, we talked about the New York City draft riots, um, the conscription riots, included arson, murder of African Americans, poor immigrant whites, um, the, the lot of gang fighting lasted for days. This is really sad. The, uh, the people that actually had to put down the riot were the Gettysburg veterans. Um, July 18, 1863, the 54th Massachusetts, the African American uh, Colored Infantry Regiment commanded by Robert Gould Shaw assaulted Fort Wagner, South Carolina. Um, Shaw and half of his regiment were killed, nearly 300 men. And then on November 19th, 1863, Lincoln delivers the two-minute Gettysburg Address at a ceremony dedicating the battlefield as a national cemetery. He declared the war being fought to preserve the union of the people, by the people, and for the people. Do keep in mind, Gettysburg starts to write uh, to different states and to the Confederate and federal government saying, hey, um, yeah, you need to come pick up your dead because we're trying to move all of our lives and there are all these dead bodies and shallow graves all over the place. We need to bury them. Yeah, it was really bad. So Virginia actually raised a bunch of money and went up, brought back as many Virginians as could be identified. And those Virginians are mostly picket soldiers and they are buried with picket in Hollywood Cemetery and there's a massive monument built. If we have an opportunity, we'll go check that out. Um, how many people have been to Hollywood Cemetery? Cool. Really great place to visit. If you haven't been, uh, it's awesome. If you're a runner, it's a good place to go for, for a jog. And it sounds a little morbid, but it's uh, really some incredible, um, some, a lot of very famous Virginians are buried there. And it's not called Hollywood because there are famous people buried there. It's called Hollywood because of the Hollywoods as you go into the cemetery. Um, but a lot of the people that we're, we've been talking about this year, guys like John and Bowden, Jeb Stewart, uh, John Tyler, I don't know if we talked about James Monroe, James Monroe, Jefferson Davis, um, they're all buried in there. So. Just uh, something to think about. We'll maybe take a look at that a bit later. So here's uh, Lincoln, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. You guys have any questions? All right, so we're going to pump the brakes, and I will... Uh,